special treat. Uh, um, a new friend of mine named Blair Lee Owens is going to come and speak to us about mental health and families. This sermon was originally intended to be part of the family series that we finished uh, in mid-May, but because of scheduling conflicts with us and Blair Lee, we couldn't fit it in, but we felt like it was really important to hear what she has to say. Blair Lee is a pastor's spouse. Her husband, Chris Owens, is a um, right now a... Um, uh, Thank you. Mission specialist for the conference. I, the conference word would not come to my head. Um, but we'll be um, going to a new appointment July 1st to um, be back in parish ministry in Annapolis at Trinity. Um, and they have three children together. And Blair Lee is a counselor by trade, though she's not currently practicing. And she, more important than all of that, she is a member of my best friend's church in Arnold, Maryland, and she gave this sermon at Jen's church, and Jen told me how powerful it was, and so I'm so excited for you to be able to hear it as well. So let's welcome Blair Lee as she comes up. Good morning. I want to thank Pastor Trish for inviting me to come, and I just want to say I love your sanctuary. It's awesome and beautiful. I slipped this week walking down the stairs and I hurt my ankle. I'm supposed to use this crutch for support, but I'm not very much of a rule follower, so I haven't been. I wonder how I'm going to get my son Jacob safely off of the bus each day, as well as getting him to the bus stop in the morning. I also wonder how I'm going to get around. There are lots of stairs in our house, and we have a dog, and always things underfoot. It's a real pain. I'm going to ask you a question, and I'd like to ask you to respond out loud. What first comes to mind when you see someone like me who's using crutches? Ouch, concern, injury, pain. I have another thing about myself that I would like to share with you this morning. I have suffered from depression for the past 20 years. I have times when I'm happy and everything seems to be going along great. But then I have times when I feel like I'm in a dark hole and that there's very little light coming in. It is hard to get up in the morning and it's hard to get motivated to do anything. I feel like I'm just going through the motions. I have learned over the years how to put on a happy face, no matter what. Now I have another question. What first comes to mind when you hear someone say that they suffer from depression? Sadness? Darkness? Loneliness? Desperation, good word. Illness. Now, I want to be honest with you. I really haven't hurt my ankle, and I haven't suffered from depression for 20 years. And I'm going to get rid of that, because it's going to get on my nerves. <laughs> I wanted to use these two examples to illustrate how differently we respond sometimes to someone who has a physical ailment versus someone who has a mental illness. As a pastoral counselor, I have worked with many people who are affected by mental illness. So let's talk about mental illness. What is it? A mental illness is a medical condition that disrupts a person's thinking, feeling, mood, ability to relate to others, and daily functioning. Just as diabetes is a disorder of the pancreas, mental illnesses are medical conditions that affect the brain and often result in difficulty coping with the ordinary demands of everyday life. Mental illnesses include depression, schizophrenia, bipolar disorder, obsessive compulsive disorder, or OCD, panic disorder, post-traumatic stress disorder, otherwise known as PTSD, seasonal affective disorder, autism spectrum disorders, anxiety disorders, as well as ADHD, or Attention Deficit Hyperactivity Disorder. The good news about mental illness is that recovery is possible. Mental illnesses can affect persons of any age, 
race, religion, or income. Mental illnesses are not the result of personal weakness, lack of character, or poor upbringing. They are not a condition that a person chooses to have or not have. No one should feel ashamed of a mental illness more than any other medical condition. Most people diagnosed with a mental illness can experience relief from their symptoms by actively participating in an individual treatment plan. The treatment plan may include individual or group therapy, medication, and sometimes hospitalization as well. As people become more familiar with their condition, they recognize their own unique patterns of behavior. If individuals can recognize these signs and seek effective and timely care, they can often prevent relapses. However, because mental illness has no cure, treatment must be continuous. Recovery is a process, not an event. Recovery is possible when the person receives the necessary treatments and support. Spirituality can be a very important source of strength. Now, to give you a so an idea of the size and scope of mental illness today in the United States, I found some statistics on the National Alliance on Mental Illness website that I would like to share with you this morning. One in four adults, which comes to approximately 61.5 million Americans, experiences mental illness in a given year. One in 17 live with a serious mental disorder or illness, such as schizophrenia, major depression, or bipolar disorder. Approximately 20% of youth ages 13 to 18 experience severe mental disorders in a given year. For 8 to 15, the estimate is 13%. Approximately 2.6% of American adults, or 6.1 million, live with bipolar disorder and approximately 6.7% of American adults, or 14.8 million, live with major depression. About 9.2 million adults have co-occurring mental health and addiction disorders. And approximately 26% of homeless adults staying in shelters live with serious mental illness, and an estimated 46% live with severe mental illness and or substance use disorders. <clears throat> Suicide is the 10th leading cause of death in the United States, which is more common than homicide. And it is the third leading cause of death for ages 15 to 24. So where does spirituality come into the picture? The Lilly Endowment reports that 96% of the population say that they believe in God. The USA Today conducted a survey that found that 79% of Americans acknowledge that faith can help recovery from illness. According to another survey, 77% of patients feel that their care provider should consider their spiritual needs as they recover. Throughout the Bible, there are mentions of demons and other personal struggles that I believe would today be recognized as mental illness. Some of those passages were read this morning. I want to specifically look at the passage from Matthew. In this story, a mother whose daughter suffered, suffers from a demonic possession approaches Jesus for help. She is desperate for help, just like any one of us would be if she were our child. We might say today that this girl was suffering from some type of mental illness, but no matter the cause for her illness, she needed help that only Jesus could give her. This girl's mother displayed the first step towards anyone's healing, hope. Now, also notice that this girl was not healing right away. It took a lot of persistence from her mother. Likewise, for people suffering from mental illness, it takes a lot of persistence, patience, and dedication. But the good news is that Jesus is there to meet us where we are broken, and he makes us whole. In 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 3-5, through 5, Paul says, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. 
the Father of compassion and the God of all comfort, who comforts us and all our troubles, so that we can comfort those in any trouble with the comfort we ourselves have received from God. For just as the sufferings of Christ flow over into our lives, so also through Christ our comfort overflows. As Christians, we suffer together. We are united in Christ, both in our redemption through his blood, as well as our suffering. We are a community of those who are hurting. If one of us hurts, we all hurt. If one is comforted, we all are comforted. Mental illness is a part of many families. In my immediate family, my husband and all three of my children have ADHD. My husband, Chris, also suffers from chronic major depression. He has had numerous bouts of depression in his life. His first was uh, after the sudden and tragic death of his fiance four months before their wedding. His second bout of depression occurred right before and in the months after his first wife left their marriage. I have been in his life for three more episodes. One occurred four years ago, after Chris lost over 80 pounds and donated a kidney to one of our friends. It took long-term therapy, support from me and our children, and medication to bring him through that dark time. Last year, he again fell into a season of depression. Thankfully, he reached out for help from me and our children. Again, he entered into long-term therapy and made the decision to remain on an antidepressant medication indefinitely. Then, just this spring, Chris's father passed away after a long illness. His death, as well as some other things going on in Chris's life, caused him to fall into the deepest and darkest time of his life. After several weeks and multiple therapy sessions, as well as discussions between the two of us, Chris thankfully made the decision to seek inpatient treatment. After being evaluated at our local emergency room, he was transferred to Shepherd Pratt Hospital in Ellicott City. He spent a week receiving individual and group therapy, as well as having his medications changed and adjusted. He is doing better now and continues to be followed by a psychiatrist, a therapist, his primary care physician, and our great physician, God. Chris's battle with depression will be a lifelong struggle, but with support and medication, he will be okay. Depression has affected my family in other ways as well. Our oldest daughter, Catherine, was sexually assaulted at her 10th grade homecoming dance. She felt afraid and alone. She didn't want anyone to know. She was ashamed. She didn't understand how God could have let it happen to her and she felt abandoned by him. She fell into the darkest black hole that she has ever been. She contemplated ending her life and ending the shame, humiliation, and intense emotional pain that she felt. Catherine didn't feel that she could talk to anyone. Everyone would think that she was a slut and that she asked for it. Thankfully, a friend at school noticed that she was upset and got her to talk. That friend then marched her down to the school psychologist's office and told her that Catherine wanted to kill herself and what that plan was. She also told the psychologist what had happened at the dance. She was Catherine's voice in the midst of her despair so that she could get help. I was then contacted and I took Catherine to our local emergency room for an emergency psychological evaluation. She remained there for 36 hours while she was evaluated. She was given many tests to screen for drugs, as well as chemical imbalances, including a thyroid problem. While there, I was allowed to stay with her the entire time. We were in a small hospital room with no windows. The bed was bolted to the floor, and there was a TV that was bolted to the wall covered by heavy plastic. They brought a chair in for me to sit on. Catherine was only allowed to wear a hospital gown with Velcro closures. I had to give them my purse, my phone, shoelaces, all of my jewelry, including my earrings, rings, and my watch. The only thing that I was allowed to have was my Bible, 
which is what got me through those 36 hours. I watched Catherine sleep, and I lost myself in the word and the promises that God gives us in times of trial and despair. It was determined that it wasn't safe for Catherine to come home, and she was transferred to the adolescent unit at Shepherd Pratt in Ellicott City, where she stayed for seven days. During that time, she received daily individual and group therapy, medical checkups, as well as medication management. I was able to visit her each evening for one hour. She was diagnosed with depression, anxiety, PTSD, as well as ADHD, which she was originally diagnosed with in the third grade. Her medications were prescribed and adjusted. Once she came home, she met with a school psychologist, a psychiatrist for a short time, and a pastoral counselor weekly. Almost two years later, she still meets with her counselor twice a month, and recently decided to start taking depression medication again after stopping for the school year. She still takes medication that treats her ADHD as well as her anxiety. During this whole experience, there were two constants, the love of her family and the love of God. During the time immediately following her assault and for several months after, Catherine says that she doubted that God was in her life However, through the love of her family and the love of her church family congregation at Asbury, as well as her youth group, she began to believe that God was with her and cared about her, that he loved her. As time has passed, her faith has been strengthened through her study of the Bible. She has learned how God is always with her and has empowered her to help other teenagers who have gone through similar situations. Students at her school have seen her resilience and know that they can go to her for advice. She has researched the resources that are available to teenagers who are depressed and need help. The school psychologist at her high school will suggest to other students who are struggling with similar situations that they talk to Catherine. She is now a light for others in dark spaces. Do you remember that story of the Canaanite woman who went to Jesus looking for help? That was me pleading for healing for my husband and my daughter. It takes a lot of hope and it takes a lot of patience and persistence. But just as Jesus healed the Canaanite women's daughter, I see him slowly but surely healing Chris and Catherine. Maybe some of you have experienced the same reality. It's okay to share your story with others. There's nothing to be ashamed of. We don't need to be afraid. When both Catherine and Chris first entered the hospital, we found it difficult to talk about it with anyone. But we found that as we opened up and shared, especially with our church family, we found compassion, grace, and most especially love and acceptance. What if we could offer that same love and acceptance to anyone who has mental illnesses as well as their families? In that way, we become Jesus' hands and feet and his heart to those who are in pain and lonely in the shadows of shame and fear. We don't need to understand everything about what is going on with another person in order to be there for them. All we need is to give a listening ear, a loving heart, and a gift of time, presence, and grace. In doing that, we could very well be the answer to their prayers for acceptance, for healing, and for hope. I want to provide you with a few resources that could help someone living in this area with a mental illness. And I'll make sure that I send this to Pastor Trish so that she can make it available to all of you this week. If you or a loved one are contemplating ending your life, call 911. You can also call the Baltimore County Crisis Response Hotline at 410 410- 931-2214 to receive immediate help and resources 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And if you live in other counties, most every county has a crisis hotline. They are mental health first responders for those experiencing a mental health crisis. They offer emergency psychological assessment as well as immediate intervention for individuals and families. If you or a loved one are in need of therapy, 
You can contact In Spirit Counseling Services. They provide therapy that strengthens both emotional and spiritual health. This interfaith agency incorporates aspects of faith together with human behavioral science that provides a rich environment for healing of mental illness and works towards achieving wholeness and health. I have received therapy services from them in the past and Chris currently sees one of their pastoral counselors. Several churches here in Baltimore County house therapists from this agency, including Faith Lutheran Church here in Cockeysville. In closing, I would like to ask each of us to think about how we can be the hands and feet of Jesus to those have, who have mental illness and their families. We can be an important part of their healing and restoration to abundant life. Amen. Stay there. Stay there. Oh, okay. Okay, I'm really sweaty, sorry. It's okay. It's okay. <laughs> Um, so I just give such thanks um, to Blair Lee and to her family who gave her permission to share those stories. It's really hard to share. So I just wanted us to um, take a minute to pray for Blair Lee and for Chris and Catherine and for all of their family and for those uh, who suffer with mental illness. So let's pray together. God, I give you thanks for this woman of faith, and I thank you for her family and for the gifts that you are pouring out on the world through them. We thank you, God, for um, their witness to um, your healing grace in all aspects of their lives. We pray that you would continue to be with them, that you would make yourself known to Chris and to Catherine and to each one of them, that day by day they would know your healing presence with them. We give you thanks for her words, and we pray that you would um, help them to just sit on our hearts this week as um, we work with our families and friends and those around us who we probably don't even know are suffering from these same things. We ask that you would help us to be these same vessels of grace that she has been for us. And we pray these things in the name of Christ our Savior. Amen. Amen. Thank you. You're welcome.